And one other quick thing, Riot runs an epic VC firm called Transform. I believe he's actually transforming VC, which needs to be transformed. He has a heart, he cares. He cares about society, impact, and I think is a great example of the types of VCs you want to be partnering with. So uh, thanks for doing this with me. Thank you, Yasmin, who's just amazing energy, put on this amazing event, brought all this knowledge to so many people. Uh, the energy here is so inspiring. We need more stuff like this. Do you have um, an executive coach or, or someone that guided you in um, forming your routines? I found some of the most effective coaches to be actually folks that aren't traditional business coaches, but are like from the mindfulness community or are, are spiritual healers uh, who you could talk to uh, about things in a way that's kind of not like, you know, I've just found a lot of bad, there's a lot of bad business advice out there. And if you're getting advice from kind of old thinking uh, business folks, you might get some good advice and, or some nuggets of wisdom, but it'll kind of lead you in a, in a weird direction. So it's, you know, it's, it's a balance of where you get your advice from. You know, there's a new way, I, I believe there's a new wave way to build a company, right? I've tried to document and write about it as much as I can. Has this informed this whole conscious culture that you, and the movement you've yeah. spurred? Yeah, it has. You know, I couldn't get any good information on how to build my company culture, right? And so I've written about three things, right? Three things you need to do in building a company. You have to, you know, raise capital, you have to recruit great people, and, you know, you have to build a great culture. Right, And if you do those things, that will create great product, that will create a great sales team, that will create a great... But those are kind of the three core essentials, so that's what I've spent my time focusing my writings on. So some of you may know my, my fundraising book, there's a second book on recruiting. And then what less people know about is Conscious.org, which is uh, our Conscious Culture initi Initiative. And so this is... This addresses the question, how do you build your company culture? Because there's very little uh, good information on that topic. And I found that the best way to build a company culture, and you know, Bolt has some of the best employee satisfaction ratings, best place to work awards, like we're an incredibly accomplished company culture. We developed conscious culture. And so conscious culture is about bridging execution with humanity. So there's some places that are, you know, they're great at executing, but they're not necessarily a great place to work, right? And there's some companies that are a great place to work, but they're not necessarily so good at executing, right? And so you'd, if you had to choose, you'd probably be in the former bucket, right? You'd probably want to be better at executing, but ideally you'd be good at both, Right? There are those rare companies that are great places to work, uh, but are also really good at executing. And so conscious culture is how you're intentional with your employees and you're like, hey, you got to perform if you're here. Right? Let's not, there should be no confusion. You have to deliver results, right? Um, but if you do, we're going to treat you very, you know, with a very high degree of respect, right? We're going to give you regular feedback, but we're going to welcome feedback as managers. So there are always mechanics to kind of deliver that mutual respect, create that humane environment in a high performance culture. Is the whole four day work week part of that or is that a... a it is, yeah. So four day work week was developed off of a, a basic insight, which is... I think that most work is uh, what I call work theater. So it's people pretend working, um, basically. <laughs> and so most of the work that takes place in corporations around the world is entirely wasted work. And it's like 1% of the people that are actually having impact and the rest that are just looking good, right? Or staying till 5 p.m. or, or whatever yeah. have you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, I was just like fed up with this because it, it was, you know, happening at my companies. And I'm like, I all I care about 
is results. I don't want to hear how much you worked anymore, how much you slaved on this, that you did nights or weekends. I used to take pride in that stuff. Uh, and, and then I found it was very destructive. Like people were burning themselves out and they weren't delivering results, but were telling me how hard they're working. And I'm like, I don't care how hard you're working. Like you're not delivering results. I don't care if you worked. And, for mo and most of the time, I actually wanted them to work way less. Like they were just significantly overcomplicating things because they weren't thinking about the outcome. They're just thinking about how to make their work look the most impressive, right? So I'm just like, you know, let's do a four day work week. Like that will force people to be more thoughtful with their meetings. Uh, it'll take them out of this kind of zombie like cycle of kind of always being burnt out. Uh, let's, let's show up for four days. Let's work like lions, right? Let's go on the hunt. Let's, let's crush it. And then let's, you know, have a great three day weekend and then come back ready to crush it again. Are you guys, do you have an office here or are you working remote or what's your setup? It's been all remote since COVID. Wow. 800 yeah. people all remote. All remote. Yeah. You intend to stay that way? Uh, we'll probably open offices again, mm. kind of shared workplaces, not required to go back to the office. I think those days are over. Um, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. We need more of this guy on the front row. That's awesome. Well, listen, we've got some questions on Twitter. Remember the hashtag bold questions. So uh, we got some questions and, and here's a question. Um, it's actually from, um, um, from someone you know quite well, Yasmin. She goes, you once tweeted Miami is the future. Can you explain? And a cat emoji. I love Miami. So I'm biased. I was born and raised in Miami. Um, so it's home for me. So Miami is awesome. Uh, it's very, one of the things I like about Miami is it's very culturally diverse. You know, here there's a bit of a tech monoculture. Miami, you meet people who are not in tech. So, you know, I like, I think having a diversity of people around you is very helpful when you're building a company because building a company is a process of creativity. Like the old school notion of how you profit I don't think applies today because all of the old school business models uh, are taken. Like the rent seeking, like old fashioned, you know, go run this market, own this market, box people out, that type of stuff. You know, there are people way more powerful who are owning all of those opportunities. You have to go after super creative opportunities, right? If you can be more creative, than anyone else, you can create your own opportunity. But there aren't really any kind of easy opportunities for the taking. It's all about creativity. And so what I found is, you know, surrounding myself with diverse people, creative people, artistic people, helped keep me creative. Versus when I was here in San Francisco, I was having like the same conversations over and over again. And uh, that wasn't helpful to me. So it was, was helpful in the beginning because like I had so much to learn about tech. So it is helpful to be around other people in tech. Um, but it's also helpful to have a diverse friend group. So you'd say Silicon Valley really helped you at the, at the start of Bolt? And yeah, solve? yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yes. So that you we would could, would you would you continue to tell brand new founders be here initially? No. Yeah, I think I think be here, get your startup off the ground, and then you know start make sure, but all the while make sure you have some things that you do to keep up your creativity. Like for me, I you know folks might know I like love to dance, love dance culture, dance community, so. That was a great creative outlet for me. Tell us your thoughts on the mob. When you, you know, are here long enough, you start to realize that there are certain people who, who hold the keys to a lot of power and capital here. Um, and so if you're, you know, aligned with them, they give your company a lot of power. If you're not aligned with them, they could crush your company. And so, you know, I just decided to point that out. But it, so Basically. If, if you were the godfather of the mob, how would you have done things differently? I mean, capitalism is, is all about, you know, greed, right? When at all costs, it's the jungle out there. I mean, there are things that companies do, even though I'm a self-interested business owner, that I never do, right? Like, I don't call, 
I don't call investors, tell them don't invest in these companies. Like I don't like ask for company information and then use it to build products. But like these types of behaviors are par for the course. Like it's seen as good business out here. Like it's seen as being a savage, you know? And like I would never do any of those things. And if I was a VC, I invest, like, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't be trying to box out competition. Like, I think there's just a lot of this vicious behavior that is just unnecessary and lame and, you know, is very short-sighted. All right. What is your outlook on the future of mobility space and investments in that area? Man, I don't know anything about mobility space, so <laughs> I think you should just throw a blockchain on it. <laughs> call it a day and, and you know you know as a VC this is I dig this response because a lot of founders are going to start going on and on but it, you just sometimes there's a lot of power in saying I don't know and that's it and that's authenticity is one of the things we look for the most I'm sure you as an investor as well and as an entrepreneur that's probably one of the things you you know on top of the list there you 100% yeah if i know something i'm going to tell you that i know it you know if i don't know something then i'll tell you i don't know it what made you write or want to write a book um which by the way is is narrated by ryan so i i have the pleasure of listening to him every time i go on my bicycle cuz it's, it's it's my audio yeah if you want an hour of this voice telling you how to fundraise <laughs> the book an audio book it's it's really yeah. incredible yeah so it started off, I believe, you know, I believe in demystifying things is like generally just a good thing for society. So fundraising, there's like a process you could run where it works. And so a lot of the founders that I knew were best at fundraising didn't want to or have the time to demystify it for the next generation. Um, so I'd always been coaching founders like... I love giving back. That's really just motivating to me. And so I was just giving the same advice over and over again on calls, like I was saying the same things. And so I finally wrote it down and made, created a Google Doc and started sharing it with people. And then everyone's like, oh, can I share it with just one other person? And so it started to kind of get a bit out of control. And someone's like, you should just like maybe make this into a book. And I'm like, that's a great idea. So I did a little bit of editing and made it into a book the fun, called Fundraising. Yeah, it's a brilliant book. So, and Thank you. And your second book is a recruiting book. Are, are you intending to write more? Um, yeah, tell me what you want me to write. I was explaining, I mean, I've, I've learned through, you know, I learned the hard way on how to do some things. So, you know, if you guys have any topics, okay. let me know. Scaling, what is Oh, man, you just got to survive. That's it. Um, yeah, scaling is a good one. The problem with scaling is it's not a big addressable audience because there's not too many people who make it to that stage, you know? And then founders who, like, know how to scale are willing to help founders who are going through that challenge. You can get good mentors, but it's the early stages where there's not a lot of good advice or mentorship. So that's why I was focusing on that. But it could be a good one. Scaling. What else? What else do we want to... Mentoring? Mobility. Mobility. <laughs> anxiety. That's a good one. I should write a book on dealing with anxiety. Yeah, maybe a book on just, like, mentality. As a founder, the highs are high and the lows are low. So how do you get out of those lows? Okay, so a couple tips on how to be a, fa a badass mentality. You know, the first simple thing that you can do to win is not want to win decide you're going to win just make that decision that you're going to win and don't let anything in your way whatever your goal is right you want to build a company that does x for the world and have it be successful just decide that you're going to do it and let nothing get in the way of you doing that it's a it's a sim it's may sound trivial but that flip in your head is very important and uh, be kind to people along the way. Which aligns quite well with our thinking at Transform is we want to see two out of three things, ideally all three things. Deep technology, which you guys have. Network effects, because as soon as you innovate, there's going to be 100 copycats. And unless you've got compounding defensibility, something that makes you stronger over time, then people will catch up. 
And then the, the last one is the 10x advantage. You just got to be 10 times better. Exactly. Otherwise, people won't leave what they got to come and use you. Um, exactly. So hmm. it's a great point. You have to think about these things, right? Like, uh, and, and this was what comes with the creativity as well in thinking through your business. Creativity is so important. It's not talked about enough, but it's super important. How's, how's, um, how can you describe your routines from the early days or kind of call it year three and four from today where, you know, it's a big company, well-funded, uh, you've stepped down as CEO, you got, you hired someone to do the day to day. Just walk us yeah. through that you're thinking there. And, and I think a lot of these insights were provided in your recruiting book, and I thought it was brilliant. It's, it's, yeah, let's... It's a use to take pride in writing code, which I'm sure you can still do today if you want to. Yeah, so, you know, I've loved writing code, but uh, that doesn't scale, obviously, right? Um, so, you know, one of the best moments that I had was hiring somebody that wrote better code than me. And I'm like, this is amazing, you know? Um, so I didn't take any pride in like being the best coder, which was what I was on track to try to do. I'm just like this, you know, people are way better at this than, than I am. And so that's when I learned the power of recruiting. And so today at Bolt, I have an unbelievable execution powerhouse executive team. Um, and I'm in a place where I have zero direct reports, right? And so that's, that was, you know, an eight year process. It didn't happen overnight, but I hired the best people on the planet and one that was so good that they were better at running the company than I am. And so I prom promoted him, Maju, from CTO to COO to CEO, right? And I have no shame in that. Like, that is something I take immense pride in, that somebody this exceptional, you know, wanted to join and... You know, I I recognize his ability to scale, and and uh, he formerly ran all global logistics and fulfillment at Amazon um, for almost a decade. And so, you know, it was just like I got the company here; he's the guy to take it here, and I just get to focus on my superpower. So, you know, the, the only way you can scale a company at this pace is with attracting great people. I found that there's four traits of compelling leaders. And this is a book called Winning From Within. So it's stolen from that. But the four traits are one, warrior. Two, visionary or dreamer. Three, thinker. And four, lover. And so, you know, if you're just a warrior, but you have no empathy, right? You're just kind of working for a machine. But if you just have empathy and you're not a warrior, then people are just going to be too emotional and mushy and people are also not going to work for you. And so the tough thing about leadership is you have to find that balance and you have to be a visionary, but sometimes you need to stop talking about vision and you need to just execute. Weak leaders anchor too much on just one quadrant, right? They're just a warrior or they're just a thinker or they're just a visionary um, or they're just an empath. And the best leaders have strengths in certain areas, but are able to play, play to all of those. And uh, I think about those four quadrants a lot. Wow. That's incredible. What's the name of that uh, book? Winning from Within. Winning from Within, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. All right. I didn't read the book. I just got, someone told me about that section. I read that section. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great.